It's an honor to be here, and today I would like to talk about performance. Before I start, I'll say a few words about who I am and how I got here. I studied music and math when I was young, and in high school I discovered synthesizers, and it may be hard to believe, but that's also when I encountered computers, uh, which were not household items at the time. But by the time I finished college, microprocessors were around and available, and I was interested in computing and synthesis, so I designed and built my own computer, um, also designed and built a synthesizer. And after a little pause for graduate studies, I went back to what I really loved, which was computers and music. And I created a computer accompaniment system as some of my initial research. And later, many of you know about the Audacity editor that I co-created at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and more recently, I've been composing opera with a uh, colleague, Jorge Sastre. We co-wrote La Mare del Pechos, and I translated that to English and produced it here in Pittsburgh. Let's talk about computer music now. I, I believe that almost all of computer music can be fit into three directions. We're on a path to create new sound, so that means studies in musical acoustics and sound synthesis. We're creating new music, which means music representations, uh, composition, organization of music, and computation. And we're creating new performance that involves control and interaction and interpretation. And I believe that performance is especially interesting today, and that's what I'd like to talk about. I will begin describing a transition that we've been seeing from instruments to interactive music systems. I will try to convince you that performance is really the new frontier for all of us. I will talk about performance models from the past and performance challenges for the future. And uh, I will end describing a sort of moonshot project about simulated musicians. So let's talk about the past, present, and future of instruments. Instruments go back a long way. Uh, to Neolithic times. We have, of course, seen a tremendous evolution in use of technology, as illustrated by some of these pictures, where instruments today can be completely digital. Because instruments and their control has become more digital and more computational, they are infinitely more flexible than instruments in the past. And this has led to a, a direction of active or interactive instruments, uh, illustrated here with uh, Max Matthews and the radio baton, Mari Kimura playing with Eric Singer's guitar bot. And the way I look at these interactive instruments is there's an opportunity for composers to design interactive computer music systems uh, that interact with performers, uh, generate music that then, of course, the performer is listening to. And that creates a kind of a feedback loop where the composer can actually um, influence the performer without specifically writing down notes to play. So this is a new kind of music notation, in my view, or a new way of structuring music, which is one of the really uh, conceptually new directions for music in the computer music era. Well, continuing to think about instruments, uh, what is an instrument and what are the boundaries of instruments? I put this diagram on the left to motivate some thinking. We normally think of an instrument as some device controlled by one human that creates sound. But what about the situation where there might be multiple humans connected to an interactive system. Uh, interactive systems are communicating among themselves. So we end up with some kind of blend between performance and instruments where it's really not clear where the boundaries are. 
so at the risk of oversimplifying the picture here, computation is blurring any distinction between instruments and performers. And I believe an important direction for NIME is intelligent interactive performance systems. So that includes artificial performers, orchestras, robots, and more. If we're going down the road of computation and performance, what do we know about performance to begin with? After all, we've spent decades studying uh, computer music sound synthesis and production based on knowledge of physics and acoustics and digital signal processing. We've studied music at the symbolic level and the structural level based on centuries of development in music theory and music representation. So it seems like if we're going to work on computer performers, we should look and see what do we know about performance to begin with. There are many areas to study in performance. One of these is expressive timing. And I've listed a raft of names of some of the pioneers in these fields. Expressive timing research has taught us that timing is related to music structure, to emotion, to physics and mechanical constraints, to randomness. And there are many studies, including uh, models and machine learning, to learn about expressive timing. In the area of emotion, which is understood and imparted by performers, there's another large body of research and we've learned that emotion can be cued by various music features, including control over tempo, uh, pitch height, the steadiness of tempo, the use of dynamics, and, and so on. Another area of performance is entrainment or synchronization. And uh, for a great overview, see this recent paper by Clayton et al., with entrainment, uh, we measure it, and we have some very interesting studies, but we don't really understand the mechanisms by which we entrain. How do we tap our foot to music? Uh, we, we can't actually build reliable systems that do that. The fourth area here is improvisation and stylistic interpretation. And by this, I mean all of the things th that performers get to do in terms of note selection, which is not usually so possible in uh, classical music, but in more popular music, you know, guitar players make up strumming patterns and chord positions, even inject new chords. Drummers design beat and patterns and create fills. And so it's almost uh, all improvised according to some style, even if the performers are reading music. So there are many examples of this and many examples of computational approaches to imitating style or uh, incorporating style and improvisation. But there's no real general theory that we can work with. So we do have some research and some theory to build on. But it's interesting to me that if you if you think about how much of this has been incorporated into interactive performance systems, well, it's pretty much none of it, except for some very specific, piece-specific algorithmic generation of music. Let's talk about some different models of performance. Perhaps the most prominent in this field has, has been the model of improvisation, and I'd like to call out Joel Chatterby and George Lewis as pioneers in this area, but of course there are many, many more. And I'd like to illustrate this with an excerpt from uh, one of my works from 1993. Uh, this is uh, essentially an Im improvisation by the computer uh, that it's extracting uh, features from the, the trumpet and interacting in various ways. <laughs>
Another model of performance is what I've called computer accompaniment. And in this model, the computer is given a score, which includes what the soloist plays or sings and what the accompanist plays. And the role of the computer is to synchronize the accompaniment uh, to the soloist. So in this example from 1998, we'll hear a, a singer with a computer accompanist playing the piano. This was recorded live in my lab, and it's the work of Lauren Grubb's uh, PhD thesis. Another model of performance is based on the ideas of conducting. Pioneering research in this area took place in Japan by researchers including Oteru, Katayose, Morita, and Hashimoto. And more recently, I've been pursuing this idea for integrating computers into popular music performance. I'd like to give this example of a performance of the tune Alone Together orchestrated by John Wilson and performed by the CMU Jazz Ensemble, along with a virtual string orchestra. You'll see uh, the eight speakers in the back, which are the string orchestra, and th the strings are cued and synchronized by one of the members of the band who is uh, tapping her foot and uh, occasionally giving some cues. The, the important thing is that you'll hear some high strings come in synchronized with the orchestra, uh, but the computer is actually following the foot tapping as a form of conducting, and so there's, there's no click track. <laughs>
the performance models we've seen so far, improvisation, accompaniment, and conducting, all deal with fairly high levels of performance involving collaboration between performers. Now I'd like to turn to a lower level aspect of performance, which is just the production of musical phrases. It seems that sound production can be separated from performance, but what I've learned in research is that up at the phrase level, the details of individual sounds are highly influenced by their context and other factors such as articulation markings, uh, slurs, phrase marking, where the note occurs within a phrase, and so on. And so if you don't incorporate all of these details into uh, synthesis and the control of synthesis, you don't actually get musical phrases and musical results. I'd like to illustrate this using uh, the work of Ning Hu, uh, whose thesis was about using machine learning to solve the problem of going from music notation to sound. And in her work, the entire system was uh, trained by examples of real performance. And th these examples were used to learn two different models. There's what, what we call the performance model, which goes from the symbolic note level score into continuous control information that controls vibrato, articulation, envelopes, and so on. And then there's the instrument model that produces the right spectrum given these this control information. So let's listen to the system, which has been trained to model bassoon performance and is now given a score that it's never seen before. A critical component of music performance is listening. We saw in, in uh, computer improvisation and computer accompaniment uh, some machine listening. And in general, machine listening has been applied at a very low level. So we build interactive systems that respond to uh, amplitude or pitch or uh, onset timing and, and various other features and map those into music generation or sound synthesis. But usually dealing with sound at a, at a very direct and low level, but it's it's rare to build systems that engage in a, in a real high level uh, form of musical discourse. And a lot of that has to do with the difficulty of machine listening. I'd like to show some work from the 90s that I did with Belinda Tom and David Watson. Uh, the idea here was to uh, try to build a system that could understand some different playing styles. So in, in the context of a, a free improvisation, as the human performer transitioned from one playing style to another, uh, which might impart kind of different musical directions and different emotions, I wanted the machine to understand where things were going and to respond accordingly. And so the way this works is we listen to uh, uh, the previous five seconds of trumpet playing and analyze that into various features uh, such as uh, pitch, amplitude, um, uh, interval size, note density, and uh, range, and some other uh, features. There's about a dozen in all. And these features go through a uh, classifier, 
And then the classifier outputs one of four, or in some other studies, eight different styles of playing. Now, these styles are nothing absolute, and it's not wired into the program. The program just uh, uses uh, some rather simple machine learning to build a classifier uh, to identify classes that are labeled in training data. So we train the system with lots of examples, and, and then the system is able to identify similar styles of playing. Well, just a little story about this before I play a demonstration. Uh, this work was done before uh, music genre classification became a major topic in the music information retrieval world. And uh, I always kick myself thinking about this, that if, if only instead of playing uh, some, some improvised jazz trumpet into the system, if I had trained it to recognize rock and country and classical music, uh, using essentially the same techniques and publish something about uh, music genre classification, it would have been a, a, a really great pioneering paper, but I missed that opportunity. So here is a, a demonstration of, of this in the lab, and then we'll play an example of this being applied to a piece. Next, I will play some excerpts from a piece in transit that uses style classification to select among different modes of interaction. Uh, within each mode, there's a lot of other things going on, including some harmonization, some call and response, some uh, tempo tracking, and all of this is also tied into uh, some real-time interactive uh, computer graphics created by Scott Draves in our collaboration. We have seen multiple models of performance that have been explored by researchers. I would like to focus on one challenge of performance, which is the task of playing together. This is addressed somewhat by accompaniment models and conducting models, and it is so natural for humans, you would think that this would by now just be a solved problem. Well, if we look at what's involved, first of all, the beat tracking state of the art considers excellent performance to be in the 90% range. And of course, it depends on the music. But 
even at, at 90 percent, um, that means we shouldn't expect to get through 32 bars of music without making a mistake. That is not really acceptable. Uh, the second issue is that of music structure. Can machines hear the form and know when you're at the beginning of a 12 bar blues cycle, for example? Uh, a third area is that of style and arrangement. Uh, you know, we're, we're good at making sequences for computers to play, but we're not very good at having computers adapt what they play to the needs of musicians. If I am in a rehearsal with jazz musicians, questions might come up like, can you play more of a shuffle or give me four bars up front and then we'll play the head. Uh, give me an eight bar intro, vocal, sax solo to the bridge and then take it out. Musicians can do that on a gig and everybody knows what's going on and everyone can play together. But I don't think machines are very close to that level. I'd like to take a little interlude here and, and talk about implementation as opposed to research. Uh, you know, in the early days of computer and electronic music, we saw systems like this one on the, on the left, uh, cobbled together from various lab equipment and custom built devices. And of course, what do we have today? Uh, we have very similar capabilities, but in a very modular packaged commercial form where a, a rock musician, for example, can buy a bunch of equipment, plug it together with very little expertise. And you don't have to be an electrical engineer to put together a, a very impressive configuration of electronic music processing. Well, I think this similar thing is happening or can happen with software. Uh, over on the left, we have the Canadian Electronic Ensemble in a, in a performance, and you see a similar kind of uh, wires everywhere, multiple different devices sort of cobbled together. And imagine a, a future where you just show up to a gig with a smart drummer, artificial intelligent horn section, automatic strings, virtual bass, and they're all coordinated and plugged together by standard protocols, and they share information and controls using uh, standards or compatible interfaces. That would introduce a whole different world of practice and availability to musicians. So I want people to at least think about what these systems might do for musicians and how they might be built for real musical practice. Finally, I'd like to describe a moonshot project for performance. The idea of a moonshot project is to establish a goal that is beyond the state of the art, but is still conceivable. And one where to reach that goal, uh, many, many advances would have to take place in many different areas. So it's uh, kind of an umbrella project under which much research and practice can flourish. Uh, well, Jerry Garcia is dead and millions of fans miss him. Jerry Garcia was the leader of the Grateful Dead, a jam band. And uh, so the question is, can we develop and apply artificial creative intelligence to fill the improvisation gap and essentially create a virtual Jerry Garcia that could once again perform for audiences. There are five terabytes of concert recordings left behind in the legacy of Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead. It's about 10,000 hours. Imagine if we could use machine learning and modeling of performance to learn from these recordings how to simulate uh, Jerry Garcia, and then perhaps combine some uh, control and coordination and collaboration through human computer music performance to actually present live performances, including a virtual Jerry Garcia. You can imagine applying these concepts to many great artists of the past who left behind legacies of music and recordings that could be possibly extended with artificial intelligence into live performance in the future. 
I'd like to wrap up now. We've come a long way. Interactive performance has transitioned from technical research to artistic practice. We'll hear many examples in this conference. We have a long way to go. Understanding music performance, at least as well as music theory and sound synthesis for music. Moving performance models and research into practice is a big challenge. We need further advances in machine listening for performance, and we need to apply those advances into real-time performance systems. I believe that expanding the notion of instrument into interactive intelligent performance systems opens many new paths for scientific and artistic NIME research.